everyone. I'm William Schick, Director of Business Development for Privateer Press, and I'm here with Michael Plummer, our convention coordinator, who's standing in for my typical co-host, David D.C. Carl, who's back home in Seattle right now. We are at TempleCon 2014 in beautiful Warwick, Rhode Island, for the Iron Gauntlet Qualifier Finals tonight. Tonight's matchup features Keith Christensen versus Charles Aerosmith. And an interesting matchup that we have here today. Isn't that right, Michael? It sure is. I'm pretty excited to see how this pans out. We've got uh, some Legion of Everblight going up against some Cricks tonight. <coughs> Keith Christensen has opted to play his uh, Wraith Witch Denegra list, mm -hmm. which includes Wraith Witch Denegra, a Scarlock Thrall, the Death Jack, a Ripjaw Bone Jack, Bane Lord Tartarus, mm -hmm. two Satixis Raider captains, a full unit of Satixis Raiders with the Satixis Raider Sea Witch, another full unit of Satixis Raiders, and a full unit of Bane Thralls with the Bane Thrall Officer and Standard. And going up against that, Charles has brought his Veil vale Console of Everbite list and has actually opted to use all of his specialists, replacing a Scythian and a Shepherd from his original list for his specialist list, which includes uh, an Angelius. Uh, two Angelis, excuse me, a Ravagor, a Shredder, a Rake, which was part of his specialist that he swapped in, a Nissa Rival, the Raptor Solo, a Blightedness Shepherd, a Spell Martyr, two Strider Deathstalkers, the Forsaken, which was another part of his specialist that he decided to swap in, along with those Deathstalkers, and a full unit of Blightedness Raptors. So an interesting choice here by Charles, who swapped out uh, several of the models that he took with him to the finals. Our scenario tonight is one that many people know and love. It is Incursion. This is the new 2014 version of Incursion, so we see a couple of differences from the 2013 version, including the side flags being moved closer to the table edge, 9 inches instead of 12, which puts them 15 inches away from that center flag. The other really exciting thing that I love, the center flag never goes away. That definitely makes for some interesting games. I'm pretty excited to see how it pans out. Now the special rules for this scenario are the outer flag can be controlled to get a single control point. The outer flag can also be dominated by the Warcaster to score two control points. With that center flag, you can control for a single control point or dominate for one as well. The victory conditions mean you need five control points to win the victory, or of course, Warcaster Warlock Assassination will end the game. So we've got a matchup here that really favors, I think, Denegra's play style of running up forward, her, her feet, which locks down enemy models. The jam list is going to be particularly effective, I think, here with all the Satixis Raiders, the high defense. However, the Forsaken could prove to be a really interesting key point in this match because of its Blight Shroud ability. And, in, and its auto-hitting pow weights against Satixis Raiders is more than enough to take out a decent number. Absolutely, and that's not blast damage, so that Sea Witch isn't going to help them at all. He's also got some really high chance of hitting between his Raptors and being able to boost with all those beasts on the field. Plus, Veil vale too, she has a nice focus of eight excuse me, a Fury of eight, so she's not going to have too much trouble hitting with spells on things. I think it's going to be an interesting matchup. I'm sure that both of our players who have fought really hard this weekend to get to this spot, Keith, who has already won a qualifiers, in fact, the first one at Lock and Load uh, 2013 last year, is certainly a veteran of this, but Charles is no slouch, and I know that he is very, very active among the Seattle circuit. So it's exciting to see these two guys coming together and facing off in this big match. You know, I've played games against both these guys, and they're both really strong players, so I think we're in for a real treat here, and uh, I'm excited to see what happens. So we so have uh, Charles, who is already deployed. You can see a very strong front with all of his war beasts and everything right on that center line. And he is ready to kind of just move right forward and right towards those flags. Yeah, and it looks like Keith has uh, done his normal deployment, and he's moving into his advanced deployment. You can see he's putting all of his Satixis Raiders way up front, right at the very edge of his advanced deployment. Definitely going to be pushing those forward to hit strong on those flags and try and block Vale from being able to score any control points, then probably using that feat to shut everything down and hopefully make this a quick game. Now, one of the things that's going in Charles' favor here is that his force definitely has a lot of speed. He's got a lot of speed 7 models. Now, the Satixis also match that at speed 7, but the Satixis, while having numbers, don't quite have the hitting power, especially that unit that's lacking the Satixis UA. Absolutely, but, you know, those Bane Thralls in the back line, they're going to make up a lot of that hitting power. They're going to take out a lot of... You know, the heavy beasts that are coming at them aren't going to be too much of a problem for them to take out, especially with that curse from Bane Lord Tartarus. Bringing them that extra plus two to hit is going to make them an effective mat eight. Keith, of course, has to be careful, however, because he's going up against Legion of Everblight, which boasts a lot of eyeless sight. So that stealth that the Bane Thralls rely on to avoid attacks from, like, the Ravagor as AoE or those Angelius' fire attacks are not going to be effective here. So he's got to play a bit conservative, and we've seen him do that before at Lock and Load 2013 where he went up against a Callus list that featured double Ravagors. Sure. 
So it looks like our players have finished their deployments and we are ready to get underway with Keese uh, first turn here. Yep. Oh, we have the two Death Stalkers, excuse me, advanced deploying at this point. Those Death Stalkers are going to do a lot of work. They're not going to have too much problem hitting those Satixis and they'll definitely take one out if they do strike. See Keith taking up his focus here as Charles finishes the deployment on those Strider Death Stalkers. Getting ready to go here. Denenger's got some really great spells that I think are going to help her out a lot in this matchup as well. Um, Hellmouth is going to make pretty good work of those Raptors. Their armor's not particularly high. And then, of course, he has Curse of Shadows so he can get through things he needs to get through. Marked for death just makes things that much easier to hit. So our players are now discussing with our judges, uh, Will Pagani and the famous Chili, uh, what scenario or what our terrain pieces are on the table. So you'll see that rough crop of rocks on the base over there. They're counting that as rough terrain, but it does not grant cover. Uh, we, of course, have a shallow water feature, which is pretty easy to identify, a hill, two linear obstacles, a trench template, and a forest template. And Our players shake hands. hands, and we are ready to get this match underway. The first Iron Gauntlet qualifier final of 2014. And the middle one in our year-long span, which leads up to the f World Finals at Lock and Load 2014. All right, so Keith is starting his turn here. And the Satixis Raiders are starting to move forward. <laughs> they are making a run move. Whew. See that 14 inches coming in to some major play here as they just get right up in those Death Soccer's faces. Yep, they are well past those flags. I think that's going to cause some really early game problems here. So we've got a couple coming up. Uh, looks like he's just a bit outside of getting the Strider Death Stalker within two inches of the Lacerator Whip. So Charles is going to be able to take a couple of shots using Swift Hunter to kind of move around with those Death Stalkers and probably eliminate at least a couple of those uh, Satixis who are trying to jam him up. And over on the left flank, we've got the other unit of Satixis moving forward. Following suit, not quite going as far as the others. I think there was a little desperate pace in there from one of the Raider captains on the first unit. Yeah, we see uh, them kind of getting into position to be able to contest that flag without going too far forward. We see a Satixis Raider captain run into the rough terrain. Ripjaw is running up the right flank. Those things are really fast and very dangerous. See Keith considering his next move here. He's definitely playing an aggressive first turn. We see Tardis running forward. Uh, not taking advantage of uh, that wall cover or anything like that. Bainthralls are following suit, running up, staying with Bainlord Tartarus. Looks like they're spreading out across the field, so he's going to be able to deal with threats wherever they come. It's a good benefit of having that Bainthrall officer. In addition to everything else he grants the unit, he also allows them to spread out a bit more with a better command. Absolutely. So we have Charles uh, jibing at Keith a little bit, asking if he's taking this seriously based on his very aggressive first turn here, just tossing models towards the fray, uh, hoping to win on uh, jamming Charles up from his next turn. Even that Scarlock is going on pretty far here. He's definitely playing this very aggressive. We have Denegra advancing forward. Keith considers. This is not cast any. Deathjack runs. Deathjack's pretty speedy himself, made up a lot of room there. Moving more towards that center flank. Keith, because he's playing with a lot of Satixis here, does have to be aware of that abomination, which he just checked for. You saw him measuring for it there. He doesn't want to have his Satixis, unfortunately, break just because the Deathjack got a little too close. All right, so Charles is going to start up his turn here. Charles considering his next move. He's definitely got some targets, uh, a whole host of targets, based on the range of, of his uh, War Beast and his Raptors. So how he mitigates... Keith's very bold first play here is going to really uh, come into its own and determine the course of this game. Yeah, Charles really has the chance here to set the tune of this game and just see if his uh, own counterattacks are going to be able to take on the really aggressive play we saw from, from Keith in that first turn. See the rake advancing forward first. He's going to take a tail strike against that Texas rake. Oh, a leap first. Get it between the two Satixis so that he'll be able to take a bite attack against one and a tail strike on the other. Good placement here. Be very careful here. with his front arc to make sure that he's facing exactly where he wants to. See a quick check by Keith on the melee distance with one of the fancy gauge keys that we all see often among our competitive players. Needs an eight to hit, boost the attack roll. Hits. <laughs> and Keith takes a fake tough check. And first blood goes to Charles. <laughs> and the first blood goes to Charles as he eliminates us to Texas. 
Tail attack, also boosted. Hits on an eight, exactly what he needed. And no fake touch test, just a tough check this time. You know, those fake tough checks can be really important. You see a spell martyr running forward. Right up into the middle of that field. I think we're going to see an obliteration shot from Vale early here. Looks like it. Looks like Charles is meeting that aggression with aggression of his own. He does have to be careful where he places that aggression, though, because blast damage is not going to affect that unit with the Sea Witch. That's right. Uh, which is the gold unit that you can see the gold helmet, the gold kind of cowls on to uh, differentiate them on the camera. Charles, Charles is really carefully here. considering his next move. Vale measures control area towards that last remaining Satixis that ran all the way up that all the way up that uh, sideline towards the trench template. He's thinking about casting the spell here. Could be doing that. It looked like she was slightly out of Oraculi range. That would be another option for him to use. Of course. See Vale refuge herself. So I think we are potentially going to see an Oraculi shot on that Satixis. You know, that refuge is really going to give Vale a lot of the no mobility here. Fires at the Satixis, which is within range 10. Boosts the hit roll to make sure that it connects. And there's no cover because the Satixis would have to be completely within the trench template. He needs a 5 to hit. Takes it no problem. Arm 11 with the Oraculite's POW of 8. Charles, considering if he wants to boost this, decides not to. Does more than enough to kill that last Tixus. Takes it out so that front line's gone. Now takes that refuge move, which is really smart here. He didn't have to advance forward. He got the aiming bonus against the Tixus and is now still in the same position he would have been if he had just advanced. We see an icy grip being channeled through that spell martyr onto the Tixus unit with the UA. He needs a six to hit. He boosts it. He gets it. That's the Texas unit now it suffers icy grip, which means they're going to suffer minus two defense, and they won't be able to run or make special attacks while well, that spell is upkept. That's going to help out a lot. Minus two defense on the Texas Raiders is a big deal because they're very hard to hit. Brings him down to a uh, healthy 14 against his ranged attacks, however. So sure. really it's kind of all a wash thanks to that Texas Raider captain. I think the no running and no special attacks is going to matter because it's going to slow Keith down a bit more. Remember, if you can't run, you can't charge. So some big, uh, some big things there in terms of neutering that unit's effectiveness. Looks like he's contemplating what he's going to do with his raptors, maybe? No, no. Moving on to Anissa. <laughs> we see Anissa moving. She goes five, seven up onto the hill. She's got two more inches left if he wants it. He's just going to keep her there, though. He's got to balance that base a little bit forward. And I think they're grabbing a little proxy to make sure that uh, she won't fall down off that hill because it's got a very sheer side. It right, looks like they're going to balance it with a die. Balance up with be. a die. <clears throat> now we should see a couple of shots from her on her prey target. So, so we have some quick math here saying that this Texas go down to 14. Anissa does have prey bonus, so she is plus two on her shot here. He's in range. This gives her a nice rat of nine. She hits, no problem. Pow 12 poison is going to kill one of those Satixis, no problem. That's more than enough. She's now got a swift hunter move if she wants to take it. Oh, sorry, a snap fire. She does not have swift hunter. Those are the death stalkers. Checking the range on that. Five will hit, no problem. Takes out another Satixis. Takes out another. Now she's got her light cav move. Of five inches. There's Charles has had some really good luck with these rolls to hit. hit well, pretty much everything he's going for here. When you're only looking for a five or a six, you should be hitting most of the time. That's Although we true. have seen dice let go horribly against players before. It's certainly something you've got to factor in, but not something you can control. So Anissa trying to decide what to do with her light cab move. Looks like she's going to shift back on that hill to try to stay out of uh, any kind of threat range from Denegra. Although with those Satixis on the uh, Keys left flank with the UA, being unable to run or charge. She's pretty safe at this point. Charles moves to his next activation. Looks like he's considering here. Not sure if he's going to go for the Raptor or the Angelius at this point. Oh, 
he's actually going with the Death Stalker. You see the Death Stalker now on the hill going. Death Stalker is going to take an aim shot at the Satixis behind the flag. The flag does not block line of sight, obviously. Hits, snipers it for one point, removes that Satixis Raider uh, leader. Swift Take Hunter's two inches forward. Charles is considering his uh, current rat right now of 10, thanks to the aiming bonus that he got. He fires on the Satixis unit that has icy grip on them. Gets more than enough, snipers that one off. It's been a really good turn so far. Swift Hunter's back away from danger. Effectively winding up right where he started. You see like he's checking his control. Vale checking control to see if that other Death Stalker can take the aiming bonus. He can, so he aims and takes a shot at that front Satikus from the Death Stalker. Fires, needing a five, no problem with an eight. Swift Hunters forward into the trench. <coughs> see another shot here at an effective Matt 10 from the Amy bonus. See a shot well within range. Fires. Gets that one as well. Swift Hunters back. Staying within that trench. And we also have a command check that's going to be forced on the Satixis. So far, an excellent turn uh, for Charles. Yeah, they passed command their command check, though, so they're not going anywhere. They love it. Raptors are advancing forward now. Now, one of the things that Charles can keep in mind here is that as long as those uh, Raptors can see Anissa, they're going to go ahead and get a veteran leader bonus from her, which gives them plus two to attack rolls. It looks so. like he's foregoing that, though. They've all moved past Anissa. He's just trying to get that little bit of extra range he's going to need to try and take down some more of those Satixes. Because I think if he can shut down the speed here and shut down that jam, he's going to have a lot easier time getting to those flags and scoring some points. He certainly has a decent amount, a uh, decent shot here of eliminating the majority of at least one of the Satixis units. He's been working on that one that tried to jam him up early and has really succeeded there. Again, the Raptors can move pretty far forward and not have to worry too much about retaliation thanks to that light cav move. He can also choose to use that light cav move to dash forward and try to jam up uh, Keith, although I don't really think that's the best play. It's certainly an option. Looks like he's going to make some shots here. So they're checking some line of sight here to see if he's going to get any kind of veteran leader bonus. He is not going to. So they're just rat seven against uh, 14s, needing sevens. First miss of the game for Charles. It's bound to happen eventually. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about it too much, Fuzz, and Charles' shoes. <laughs> Thing about that, though, is if he had had that veteran leader bonus, he would have hit with a five. That's true. But that one didn't miss. Gets the seven there. Poison ensures that that Texas is no more. See another shot against the next Texas. Hits with no problem. Looks like he didn't need that veteran leader bonus too much after all. We'll see. That unit is down to just two members now. See a Take shot at less shot. than 10 away, which is good. Dice rolls off the table and misses. Last shot. He's actually shooting at the unit with the UA and connects thanks to Icy Grip. A little so confusion about who was shot, but we see it all get cleared up and we're removing the casualties from the table. Using that light cav move to move back just like you thought he would. Yep. Being able to strike and then fade away until that flag is determined is going to be huge here. It's also going to be really big for staying out of Denegra's feet range because that feet is really going to hurt. Being locked down by that feet is definitely going to be uh, a big concern, especially as we get into the scoring rounds of this game where Keith is going to be able to lock Charles out of position in order to either control or potentially dominate a flag depending on uh, game position. The Ravagor moving up six onto the hill. <coughs> he used his dragon fire animus, so his attacks are going to cause continuous fire. See a shot 14 inches towards, uh, that's the Texas where you see the ruler going towards, that is part of the UA. So they, will, range. they will not suffer any of the blast damage, but they'll still be set on fire, which is exactly what he's going for here, knowing that they're out of range. And a fire damage roll is going to be more than enough to take out a Satixis Raider, so he's hoping for a good deviation here. So we'll see what he gets here. It's all going to be on. He's not looking for a four. Goes one four inches, so that's pretty good. It's he's going to catch a couple of them. Mm. Looks like just one. Charles reminds Keith that the scather does need to go on the ground because it's going to stay there for a round. 
So it gets the Sea Witch UA, which is kind of big. That's definitely the one you want to hit. She has five boxes, though, so a low roll could mean that she lives on the next turn, or even if it goes out, but I wouldn't be too hopeful here. Removing that Sea Witch UA does take away Power Swell uh, before they get to unit, which would be a pretty big boon uh, to Charles at this point, especially since that unit is going to stay icy gripped. It Denied. also takes away the Force Barrier, so that Ravagor could really do some damage with its blast if she does die at the beginning of the next turn. We see the Angelius on Charles's right advance forward and shoot. He boosts the attack roll and does hit thanks to Icy Grip, removing the Force Barrier defense bonus against ranged attacks. Plus two, minus two brings them to a 14. You know, it really looked like Keith had a lot of models on the table at the beginning of the turn, but he's done a pretty <laughs> good job of... Uh, he has definitely, a lot of them out. He has definitely thinned the herd. And unlike uh, an Asphyxious 2 list or anything like that, Denegra is not much of an attrition game player. So being put on the back foot like that uh, with some great, uh, some great answer from Charles here in terms of the Striders, the Raptors, everything uh, hitting just like he wants, he is in a good position right now. Yeah, once those models go down, they're not coming back. Now with Denegra. We see the Angelius flying to the trench. And that was a run, so you see that Fury point going on to mark uh, the expenditure of Fury there. Charles is counting up that Fury, making sure he's going to be able to make the best use of it next turn and not have anything to take a frenzy check. Get enough back. We see the Forsaken advance forward and take no Fury this turn because Vale is going to need it all. He's gonna now we're going to see a roll for the flag to disappear. And the far flag disappears, which is the one that nobody was really close to. So... Doesn't Overall, like I, think if I'm, too much. I think if I'm Charles, I kind of I regret the fact that that flag went away since I just wiped out most of Key's flank on that side. Uh, but now we're going to see a good match where there's going to be a lot of blood. Looks like that Satixis Raider captain did got burned alive. Did get, did get bought the farm. So no so more power swell, no more force barrier. That's a huge. That's a huge boon. Those uh, those Satixis will keep Pathfinder though because that is a tactics ability. So that's something, especially with that water terrain right in front of them. They're still going to be able to get through it without too many problems. So we've got a one Sedixus unit down to just two members, another Sedixus unit losing their officer and a few members of the unit. Keith now sitting there considering what he's going to do this turn to answer Charles's huge first turn. If I was Keith right now, I'd feel on my back foot a little bit because losing an entire unit of Satixis Raiders, especially with the list build that he has, is a huge detriment. Luckily, the flag went away that was right in front of them, so he still has some tactical options here, but it's looking a little weaker than it did at the beginning of the first turn. Well, and the thing is is that he's still got that full unit of Bane Thralls. Tartarus was untouched. Like, you know, if you're, if you're looking at this heavy war beast or this war beast centric Veil list uh, with a lot of multi-wound models, losing those to Tixis is really the best option for you. Having those Bane Thralls get removed takes away a lot of your hitting power. Absolutely. And if you look at the way that Charles is set up here, it looks like a lot of his squishy models, you know, some of those Death Stalkers, it looks like uh, the Shepherds are kind of close. A couple Hellmouths here through that rip could cause some real problems. It'll be interesting to see what Keith decides to do here. Still pondering. He certainly has plenty of time, like we talk about a lot, you know, every time we watch these guys play. Uh, managing the clock is important, but also not making rash moves, especially early on while you have the time to spend, is a big deal. Uh, Keith also doesn't have to worry quite as, about, quite, quite as much about so many models. We see that Stixis Raider Captain advance into the flag, base to base, so that she will be able to score if Charles doesn't answer. She also desperate paces the uh, Stixis unit that just lost their UA. So they'll be able to move a, a hefty nine inches, but because of Icy Grip, no charging, no running. He's thinking a little bit harder now about what he's going to do next. He's got a lot of options here still. Looks like he might be activating the Scarlock. See the Scarlock being proxy based by that purple uh, token there. Yep. Because he can't quite fit where, the, fit the where the wall is with the model because of that soul coming out the back. Keith uh, mentioning that his Stixis are going to take off at the speed of light. And looks like they were ghost walked by the Scarlock. So 
Interesting move here going on as the Satixis advance forward. Checking for melee range on that Angelius. Decided that he wants to be in melee with the Angelius. So we see the sticks is going base to base with each other here. Trying to block the repulsion. Covering a lot of ground here. Very careful movements. And it looks like they've just realized that they can't run under the effects of Icy Grip. So the judge is making a call, realizing that Icy Grip means that those Satixis Raiders cannot run. So, so we're going to see them uh, pull back the Satixis Raiders to approximate places. And part of the reason that we have such a robust judge program and we make sure that we have at least multiple judges on the table uh, because in the high pressure situations, you know, you're not familiar sometimes with what your opponent's stuff does. You can sometimes make a couple mistakes like that. So Absolutely. You can see that shrug from Keith. They're both being great sports about it. Mistakes happen, not a big deal. So Keith is really taking his time now trying to figure out what he's going to do and having a little discussion with Charles about what's going on on the table. Some questions with the judge. Trying to return the board state. So, All right, so a little bit on my mistake on my part. Icy Grip does allow them to charge. They just can't run. So uh, part of the confusion on Charles's end, uh, our judge's part there for the moment when Keith was making his moves, they thought they were charging. Uh, because that's what he declared, but with a run. So they fixed that now. We're back to our position, and the game is on. Still rolling so. forward. Same moves going forward, blocking that repulsion with another Satixis behind the first one. Getting into melee with the Angelius. So this is only nice. able to go 12 inches. Only 12 inches. With Thanks to desperate pace. Two-inch race on the last Raider, giving them a threat range of 14. Still hefty. They did lose their power swell, though, so I don't think that Angelius is in too much trouble. Not from a single attack. No. Although those Satixis are still going to do a great job of jamming up uh, Charles's line. He's going to have to deal with them. Uh, looks like the Satixis on the hills managed to get both the Ravagor and the Strider Deathstalker into their melee range. We see no damage on the hit to the Angelius, I believe. See so a hit. Dice minus two on the rake. Little confusion about the math here. So you see it looks like six points to that rake. Roll the snake eyes there, so a miss. Attacking the rake. So that six points was on the Ravagor, excuse me. See an attack on the rake. the rake. Does eight points to the rake. Eight points of damage to a light war beast is nothing to sneeze at. See Charles asking the confirmation on the leader. Right Since in the middle there. That'll be an easy way to divide up the Satixis and force some of them to not be able to take free strikes by moving the leash. Checking some melee ranges. A little discussion at the table. Keith's thinking about what he's going to do next. So we've got a little bit of discussion here on terms of where they wound up in terms of 
uh, movement. We see another desperate pace move on those last two Satixis Raiders from that unit that Charles really cut through. See Keith determining where he's going to put those Satixis. So have a run. Thinking about it, declared it, so he's going to have to do it. Only run six inches, though. Looks like he thought better of it at the last second there. He's trying to stay out of the rake's free strike zone right now. So Keith using his own melee range to determine what the rake's melee range is, which he's allowed to check at any time. Making sure he stays out of it so he can move forward and engage some of the targets behind there are going to cause him some more problems later. <laughs> Looking to see if he's going to get a free strike from the model on the hill, which looks like it's a Death Stalker. Mm -hmm. Just trying to make so it very clear that he's staying out of melee range, making sure it's quick possible. Quick move of melee range base. here. So, quick discussion about uh, movement range and where the, uh, the melee distance is. So it looks like see. engaging two raptors there, staying out of the rig's reach. Also trying to stay out of the raptors' uh, melee range there. Well, the Satixis can really, really make some long moves on the board. With desperate pace, base speed seven. All kinds of options there in terms of movement. With reach from their last Raider whips, they can tie up a hefty amount of models. Including Vale there. So that's going to make for some interesting choices on Charles's part next turn. He's got a decent amount of models there that can handle it. That Shredder certainly can just go up, rabid, and bite that Satixis. Sure. That depends where the second Satixis winds up, though. Certainly also has the possibility to get to Vale, potentially. Although it doesn't look like that's what Keith is going to do. So he just wants to tie up that rake and uh, that raptor in the trench. Sort of replacing the ones he lost last turn. Make we see a charge, here. and the attack uh, misses from that one. Counting his focus here. <laughs> so the Thralls receive a run order. Keith moves that, that prey token uh, up with the Texas unit that is preyed by Anissa Raval. The Thralls are making their way up. Looks like on the next turn, if Charles doesn't have a way to deal with them, they're going to be striking hard and taking out some of his big heavy targets. So Surprised to see the... Uh, one of the Bane Thralls move into the shallow water feature. Bane Thralls lacking any kind of inherent Pathfinder ability. He's probably counting on the fact that the Scarlock's going to be able to ghost walk those next turn and they won't suffer any ill effects in the water. Getting base to base with that flag, trying to fill up as much real estate as he can. He won't be able to score from the Bane Thralls, however, since uh, he moves it away from base to base now. Yep. Because he won't be able to get that entire unit within four inches of the flag with his current positioning. Is Keith carefully considering where to move the rest of his Bane Thralls next. Ask for a range on obliteration from Vale. Clearly trying to avoid any of that. Uh, massive POW 15 AOE 4 spell that Vale can cast. Thinking really hard here. He's got a lot of decisions to make. He lost a lot on that first turn. Still sitting in his Bane Thrall activation. So moving the rest of those Thralls up. 
Well, Keith, filling in the area around that flag and on the water, making sure that he's not leaving too many holes for anything to get through, and making it hard to clear out and score any points on that flag. Although he's also got a pretty good cluster there, despite asking for the range and obliteration and uh, being very aware of Charles's AOE abilities here. Must um, be feeling pretty safe about him. See the clock there. Notice that so far, time is going all right with Keith Still down to 40 time. minutes. Although Clock he will have 60 minutes per player, so he will have to remain aware of that, especially if he has more turns like this one where he's having to carefully consider model placement, where he wants to move things. Well, Keith is a very careful player, a very considerate player in terms of how he activates his models, where he puts stuff. He's very, very custom to playing with lots of troopers, so typically well at managing the clock. Very clean play here. Very careful about where he's placing everything. It's good to see that. Looks like Tartarus advanced forward. Tartarus actually charged, I think. So straight dice against... Uh, Looks like the rip jaw. Interesting play there. And 14 damage. 14 to his damage own to the rip, rip jaw. jaw. That's a lot of points. That is a decent chunk out of that that light bone jack. So what I was talking about before with the hellmouth out of that rip jaw doesn't look like that's going to be possible anymore. See the death jack. Uh Seen Abomination check really quick. She loves she, it. Raider Captain passes. See another charge attack against uh, the Rip Jaw from the Death Jack this time. It's becoming a little bit clear to me. It looks like he's trying to create a wreck marker for Denegra to stand in. Give her that extra bonus defense. <laughs> well, he certainly succeeded. Well, Death so. Jack will do that. Well, Tartar's hitting for 14 points of damage certainly started it off right. Uh, now that Ripjaw is scrapped, and there's a wreck marker right there that Denegra is going to stand in. So Denegra's advancing forward, she checking her control area. Toes into that wreck marker. Looks like we're going to see Denegra's feet this turn. And he does go ahead and use that feet. So Wraith Witch Denegra is activating Web of Shadow. And what that means is that enemy models currently in her control area are going to suffer Shadow Bind for a round, which drops their defense by three. And for one round, when advancing, it can only move by changing facing. So no forward, no back. All you can do is turn. Charles asking if uh, Wraith Witch Denegra is incorporeal this round or not. So no points yet. But with uh, Denegra's feet up, Keith is likely to score a point this time. Well, Denegra is not incorporeal, though, so depending on how ranges work out, he might have a couple shots on him. But in cover, that certainly makes it a difficult shot. Absolutely, but when you, when you boost those rolls, you can hit just about anything. She is camping on, it looks like, five focus right now, bringing her armor up to a respectable 19. So a quick check of Denegra's control zone once more to determine who is shadowbound and who is not. So one of the interesting things about that shadowbound move is remember when Keith was very carefully positioning his uh, Satixis, one of his remaining Satixis from that unit that took such a beating on Charles's first turn, to keep them outside of half of an inch melee range of those Raptors, and now we know why. Uh, not only does it force those Raptors to be unable to attack in any way, shape, or form because they can't make ranged attacks. They also aren't going to be able to retaliate against her. And it's going to be a turn where Vale's going to have to do a lot of the work. So we see Anissa activating first. So shooting at her prey targets. Doing a little mouth. He's double ones to miss uh, that first Satixis. 
Can't not kill. Pieces. We see a replacement for the unit officer. Snap fire. Allows him to shoot at the second one. Calculating up. Five. Needs a five to hit a def 16. Can't not kill. Eliminates that one. Frees up the Ravagor and that Strider Deathstalker. Keith has to replace his leader once more. Icy Grip definitely doing its work, especially now that Force Barrier is down. Anissa at her impressive aiming rat of nine plus two for Prey, making her an 11. Just a that, that can't miss cal proposition. That fast cavalry move on the first turn, taking her back, just kept her just out of range of those Satixis engaging her. And it looks like that might play an important part in what happens here next. Certainly has allowed hit Charles to clear up some of the chaff, blocking his ranged models that can't shoot this turn, that Ravagor and the Strider Deathstalker. The question is what he's going to try to do with that at this point. He needs to clear out a lot of those Bane Thralls with, unless he wants to suffer a pretty crippling uh, Alpha Strike from Keith on his following turn. Because he's bound so tight with Denegra's feet, uh, there's not a whole lot he can do to try to avoid it, and he certainly can't get forward and engage those uh, Bane Thralls. He's still got quite a few range attacks on the table, though, between his Angelius and the Ravagor. Uh, looks like some of the Raptors are still going to be able to make attacks, so I don't think uh, this game's anywhere near over. No, not at all. There's certainly a lot of time left to play in this game, and plenty of moves left. However, the table could easily swing back to Keith's favor if those Bane Thralls are allowed to get a charge in any significant number. Charles's list really relies on those heavy war beasts to do a lot of the heavy lifting. In addition to those Raptors, it's a low model count army, so removing even two or three of those pieces significantly hinders what he's able to do in return. And if there's one thing Bane Thralls excel at, it is taking out heavies <laughs> with their Dark Shroud ability and Weapon Master. They do quite a bit of damage. So Charles, now it's his turn to kind of sit and take a... Take some consideration time, figuring out what his next move is going to be, despite the fact that he doesn't have to worry about where he's positioning his model so much, but where he's going to try to apply all the force that he has. Charles is kind of lamenting Denegra in cover right now. <laughs> and we see Keith sitting off to the side, looking quite comfortable, feeling pretty safe, I would think. Rake still has all its aspects. So we see a quick check here. Might see a leap from the rake. We do see a leap. And then we... So now we see a quick from the judges. See a quick discussion. Pausing the clock to try and get a ruling here. So because the feat allows him to full advance, he can leap. So it looks like that rake is going to be able to leap. Right not, into Denegra. He's not made to not be able to charge, it's just that charge wouldn't go anywhere if he could. Correct. He can't advance under the feats wording. He can only just change facing. They're going to check melee range when they get in. So, so he will, will be within half an inch melee range for Denegra, allowing him to do the bite and the tail. Being really careful with the models here. So the rake has leapt forward and engaged Denegra as well as uh, a few of those Bane Thralls with its reach tail. So Denegra's sitting on defense 16, so she's still pretty tough to hit for the rake. So we see a boosted attack roll. Making sure he's base to base with the flag. Yeah. See a boost to hit. He needs a 10 to hit. So here comes the roll. 
Comes up to 12, so that's a hits. Hit. So she is knocked down now because it was a headbutt. Definitely not a good thing for Denegra right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to take his damage roll at strength 8 strength against eight her 19. Armor 19, so dice minus 11 here. Hoping for boxcars. Do that sure, do point. that single point. It might mean the difference. That's right. <laughs> Always should take it if you got it. So Denegra's cover now not offering her quite the... Uh, Questioning some line of sight from the Ravagor. So on the hill, he has no problem seeing over that stuff to see to Denegra. You see an Animus to turn that AoE fire. into fire. See a boost to hit. He hits. hits. She is now on fire. And she's going to take a damage roll here. And she'll take a damage roll, which Charles will boost. So arm 21, actually. She has all of her focus on her. Four Does points. four points. So that means she's got 12 left. So doing some blast damage calculation. The rake is caught in the blast. So are, looks like, a couple of Bane Thralls. He's boosting the damage roll against one of the Bane Thralls. Does enough damage to force a tough check. And tough check, check has failed. Other guy, no damage. And on his rake, minus six damage. Does no damage. But they will both be on fire. And they are both on fire, yes. And that scather is going to remain in play next turn. Marking those models is on fire. You know, with a base armor of 14, fire's not a good place for Denegra to be in. Not at all, and I'm sure she's going to take a couple more shots uh, this turn from definitely that uh, that Angelius in the trench should have not only line of sight and uh, range. Looks like he's uh, taking a look at that Angelius, making sure he has line of sight, maybe thinking about what he's going to do here. couple of considerations here. There we see our judges, Will Pagani and Michael Chili winners. Helping us out here, making sure plays clean. Doing a little card checking on the War Room app, it looks like, on Wraithwitch Denegra. Charles considering what his next move is going to be here. So Flame Jets only POW 12. We've seen aim and a shot against uh, Denegra. Does hit because she's knocked down, even, even dice, with that cover boast. Dice minus See nine. See a boost. Dice minus nine. Needs a big roll here. Rolls a 17 for Denegra. Eight more points, leaving her on four Wow. That, that when hurts. you need a huge roll, you get a huge roll. So now we're in a place where that fire damage can really do her in if he happens to miss with everything else. So we see uh, the Raptors going next. One of the Raptors was outside of the feet, so he will be able to advance. So we've got a lot of aiming dec declarations here. It's like four aims, and that one Raptor that's able to move is going to do so. Yep. I wonder yeah, where he's going to shoot. <laughs> you know, there... They certainly, they only need to do four points, but they're only POW 10s, and the poison isn't going to matter on her because this is Wraith Witch, not War Witch. That's true. She is undead. See a quick check. We've got Anissa on the hill, so veteran leader bonus is here. First one hits. Can't not kill that Satixis, which clears her out of the way. Frees up a Strider Deathstalker, who can uh, do at least a point with Sniper, but would not get a Snapfire bonus. Sure, but when there's only four left, that one point can be all the difference. See a shot on the Bane Thrall. Hit. Point of damage. Tough roll is failed. Failed. Tough roll succeeds, actually, it looks like. 
Light calf move. So that one gets the light calf move. Shifts over. I'm expecting that we'll get to see a uh, Araculi spell sling shot into Nenegra with the feet. Yep. Two, uh, two obliterations boosted. Could certainly do the trick for four extra points here. Yep, we see that yep. happening now. Miraculous. Miraculous into his back. Hits no problem. Hit. Looking for damage. Trying to get low. Does a point. Not enough to kill that raptor. That's Luckily good. Charles. <laughs> yeah. That's where you don't want to roll high. Just popping Just her feet. Bale popping her feet. We're going to see two obliterations at least here. Boost to hit that obliteration. You don't want to miss that. Okay. So he's going to icy grip first. Does hit. So now Denegra is minus two defense. Still, still nothing but uh, three or betters to hit here. No snake eyes. Boost to make sure it Woo. doesn't happen. He rolled a lot of ones on that too. Dice minus six. And that does three, three points. Damage. She's got one left. One point left. We see a cast of obliteration. Not bothering with the rest of his spells here. Hits no problem. We see it boosted. This could be it. And seven to kill. Two points, Wait. does it? Our players shake hands. Charles, Charles wins with an assassination against the Denegra with a great headbutt set up from the leaping rake after her feet. Does not stop from being able to advance five inches forward. That was so a, a little miscalculation on Keith's part, which leads to Denegra's untimely demise. Pretty impressive assassination there, I'm not going to lie. A lot of the times you see Denegra on the field in this kind of scenario, and you, you expect a win out of her just because her feet is very powerful. But that rake being able to leap really did her in here. I'm, I'm really impressed. That was a great game, a uh, great setup by Charles. Good moves on both, great play by both players. A lot of uh, happiness on Charles' side of the field. Keith kind of looking things over and considering what he's going to do different next time. But he's already got a qualifier win under his belt, so he's got plenty of points. And finishing second here doesn't hurt that either. That's right, so folks. these guys are on the road to the finals at Lock and Load 2014. We're looking forward to seeing everybody there. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us despite the change in schedule. We hope you all enjoyed the match, and we will talk to you guys on the next Iron Gauntlet qualifier down the road. Thank you. This is from Will Schick and Michael Plummer saying good night and goodbye.